Uh, and today, it's my uh, real uh, pleasure to introduce uh, David Wallace, who is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Southern California. He's been there for now just a few uh, months. And uh, USC managed to get the man out of Oxford, uh, which <laughs> looked to have been quite something, because he was an undergraduate, a graduate, and a professor at Oxford. <laughs> but things happen, even, even people who are really true Oxonian, I guess that's a, that's a term, uh, can get a can be taken out of Oxford. We won't ask what was needed <laughs> to get the man out of Oxford. I'm quite curious, however. Uh, so those of you who have dinner tonight with him, here's your task. Find out <laughs> <laughs> what USC offered him to get him out of Oxford. Um, there's no doubt that uh, uh, David is one of the leading philosophers of uh, physics these days, uh, one of the uh, really most important Philosophers, his uh, early work was on Everett, and he's now working on many other projects, one on statistical mechanics, he just told me. And today is going to be a slightly different project uh, on uh, quantum mechanics, and he's going to be talking about what is orthodox uh, quantum mechanics. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, the date of this uh, is the usual LaTeX thing of compiling the slides the day before, so ignore it. We hear a lot about orthodox quantum mechanics in philosophy of physics. So in the first instance, it's the foil against which your preferred way of thinking about quantum mechanics is measured. So one says that my favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics differs from orthodox quantum mechanics in the following ways. Or more generally, orthodox quantum mechanics suffers from this terrible measurement problem, and this is what we should do to change orthodox quantum mechanics to resolve it. Even when we're not doing the foundations of quantum mechanics and trying to solve the measurement problem, we often refers to orthodox quantum mechanics when talking about what might happen when quantum phenomena are allowed for in some other bit of physics or some other philosophy of science context. And again, if one's trying to be interpretation neutral as much as possible, you'll frequently find claims like, according to orthodox quantum mechanics, blah, 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 with maybe a footnote to the effect of how things might be different in rival positions to orthodox quantum mechanics. And what I want to argue in this talk is that philosophy of physics is basically wrong about what orthodox quantum mechanics is. <clears throat> and to be clear, I don't mean that orthodox quantum mechanics is wrong. It is, but that's not the point. I mean that what philosophers say orthodox quantum mechanics is, is not, the, is not what you would read off physical practice as a description of orthodox quantum mechanics. It is to some limited extent what you might read off introductory textbooks in philosophy of quantum mechanics, sorry, in quantum mechanics. But if we learned anything from Kuhn, it was that looking at what the te introductory textbook says about a theory is not necessarily a definitive guide to what the theory actually says. And if we look at the actual practice of physics and try to reverse engineer from that what the theory is that is being used, it differs from orthodox quantum mechanics in fairly substantial ways. And I think this has implications for the pedagogy of philosophy of quantum mechanics, and also implications for how physicists and philosophers of physics can communicate. And one of the motivations for this piece of work was observing that very often in these conversations, people just seem to be talking past each other and coming to realize that part of the reason they were talking past each other is that the basic assumptions as to what orthodox quantum mechanics is before you started changing it or reinterpreting it were just different across the communities. So what I'll try to do in this talk is identify in particular two key features of philosophers' orthodox quantum mechanics that I think don't have any place in a you know, naturalistic account of what orthodox quantum mechanics is. And then towards the end, I'll try to say something about what I think a better construal of orthodox quantum mechanics is and how we might think about the quantum measurement problem from that perspective. OK, so let me put up for display the sort of, sort of the villain of the piece, the orthodox account of quantum mechanics. So it starts with something you might call the formal core, which I don't want to, qu to quibble with, and I just want to put up here for reference. So the formal core of the theory is, I have a Hilbert space. States of my system are normalized vectors in that Hilbert space, or if you like, they're rays in that Hilbert space, or density operators on that Hilbert space, but we'll, do, we'll make do with vectors. The physical quantities for the system, each of them corresponds, weasel word to be sure, corresponds to a self adjoint operator on that Hilbert space. And we have a dynamical equation, the Schrodinger equation, which tells me how the quantum states evolve in time. 
tells you what the state is at some later time, given the state at some earlier time, which depends functionally on the form of the operator that corresponds to the energy observable. And furthermore, in the core, any time we want to use the theory to make predictions, we apply the Born rule, the probability rule. Its mathematical form doesn't matter, but just briefly to remind people, if we have an observable which corresponds to this operator, which is decomposes the sum of projectors with the eigenvalues for each projector, um, then the probability of a system with a given quantum state psi having, or perhaps we should say being found to have, or having on measurement a particular value OI of the observable O is given by the expected value of that projector. The mathematical form doesn't matter. Crucial point is that the Born rule tells us that the only possible outcomes of a measurement of O are the eigenvalues of the operator corresponding to O, and furthermore tells us the probabilities of those outcomes as a function of the quantum state and of the observable in question. OK, so I'm not going to quibble with all of that. that. That much is legitimately in orthodoxy. But here are two other foundationally central principles that I think aren't so lucky. Here's the eigenvector eigenvalue link. Here we say, if I've got a system in state psi, it has a definite value, little o, of an observable big O, even only if it's an eigenstate of the operator corresponding to big O with that, eigen, that value as its eigenvalue. So for any given observable, there's a certain collection of states, its eigenstates, which have definite values of the observable, and all other states have indefinite values of the observable. We also have the state factor collapse rule, or the projection postulate, or the collapse of the wave function, where we say, if we measure an observable O on the system, it immediately transitions, it jumps, it collapses randomly, stochastically, into one of the eigenstates of uh, the operator corresponding to O, and the transition probabilities for a given jump are given by the same mathematical formula as in the Born probability rule. And given that the um, state vector collapse rule is pretty clearly not a special case of the Schrodinger equation, we then tacitly or explicitly note that we're only assuming Schrodinger evolution between measurements. So the process of measurement suspends the Schrodinger equation and instead applies the collapse. And in fact, if you have the state vector collapse rule and the eigenvector eigenvalue link, you can pretty much derive the Born rule. And so in fact, the Born rule often gets backgrounded in foundational discussions of quantum mechanics as an independent posit. Because if I make a measurement of some observable O, and that instantaneously causes the system to collapse into one of the eigenstates, then by the eigenvector eigenvalue link, in instantaneously after the measurement, the system actually has a definite value of the observable being measured. Um, and so if you make the fairly weak assumption that when a system has a definite value of some property, um, a measurement uh, of that property returns that value, then the Born rule just comes out as a logical consequence of the projection postulate and the eigenvector eigenvalue link. And both of these principles, state vector collapse, the eigenvector eigenvalue link, come up all over the place in the foundational discussions in quantum mechanics, and in particular in discussions of the measurement problem. In fact, both of them are normally standard ways of setting up the measurement problem. So here are sort of two routes to the measurement problem that you find in the literature. So one way of setting it up goes via the eigenvector eigenvalue link. Um, quantum mechanics permits quantum states which have indefinite values of macroscopic observables. So for instance, if I consider the observable that's the center of mass of this lectern, then there are quantum states which are eigenstates of the center of mass with position here and quantum states that are eigenstates of the position here. But there are also superposition states that are some equally weighted superposition of, um, this, of the state corresponding to here and the state corresponding to here. These are states which have indefinite values of lectern location, the fine lectern that doesn't have quite those kind of magical properties. More, more crazily, as we all know, if I consider the, prop the property of being a living cat, then we can have quantum states which have a definite value of being a living cat and either definitely do or definitely don't have that value, but we can also have superpositions, which are somehow in an indefinite state of living catness. And these kind of states don't make sense, or at any rate, they don't seem to correspond to anything that we observe. We can also get to the measurement problem via the collapse rule. The collapse rule 
at first sight is in straight contradiction to the Schrodinger equation. We have a contradiction between the idea that dynamics is deterministic and unitary versus the claim that dynamics has this stochastic component. If we relax the contradiction by saying, well, Schrodinger evolution applies when measurement doesn't happen and wave vector collapse happens when measurement does happen, then the dynamics is seriously ill-defined because it relies on the notion of measurement as the definition, as the criterion for when we should use one dynamical rule rather than another. So when I want to criticize orthodoxy in this talk, the orthodoxy I want to criticize is precisely the eigenvector eigenvalue link and the state vector collapse rule. I want to say that neither of those are part of orthodox quantum mechanics. And again, just to, to stress to the point of tedium to avoid misunderstanding, I'm not saying they're wrong. I, I, I independently think those principles are wrong. Um, you know, my, <laughs> As, um, as Edward said, a lot of my earlier work has been on the Everett interpretation, which certainly doesn't have a collapse rule. So I certainly don't, th don't think the collapse rule is part of the right understanding of quantum mechanics. But in addition to that, right or wrong, the collapse rule is not part of the orthodox interpretation of quantum mechanics, and neither is the eigenvector eigenvalue link. And I'll make that case in reverse order. I'll talk first about wave function collapse and then about the EE link. That's worth saying briefly before I do that, incidentally. Um, when I give this talk in a philosophy context, then that breakdown of two principles works fairly straightforwardly. Everyone recognizes both of those principles. I've been structured by noticing that while state vector collapse is something that's part of what physicists learn about quantum mechanics when they're undergraduates, and so they can take some persuading to recognize it's not part of the orthodox framework, the eigenvector eigenvalue link really is a philosopher's invention. It's not something really that uh, physicists come um, come in contact with much at all unless they're actively working in the foundations of physics. That's just a sort of profoundly note for going through this. OK, so let's talk about state vector collapse. I want to start with some sort of indirect, you might say almost sociological evidence for why we shouldn't think of collapse as part of orthodox quantum mechanics. I'm not really intending to give a sociology talk here. What I'm, when I say collapse isn't part of orthodoxy, I'm really meaning the rational reconstruction of the theory that physics is doing based on the practice of physics can't be um, one that has collapse in, rather than physicists, when asked, aren't committed to collapse. But I think the sort of evidence from physical practice at the indirect level has, has some value to set the stage. So let's consider some cases here. Collapse does come up in textbooks, to be fair. In first courses in quantum mechanics, you do run into collapse quite often. I, when I check the books on my shelf, then I found that for the first course on quantum mechanics books, I had about a dozen of them on my shelf. And about half of them explicitly state a collapse postulate. And to be fair, those half are probably the more mathematically careful and conceptually rigorous half. But we don't find the collapse postulate in second courses on quantum mechanics, in, text in textbooks with titles like Advanced Quantum Mechanics. And in particular, we don't find the collapse postulate in textbooks on relativistic quantum mechanics or on quantum field theory and particle physics. And this ought to confuse us. It confused the hell out of me when I was an undergraduate because collapse is supposed to be an instantaneous process. If I have some entangled system where I've got um, two, two entangled spin half particles very far from one another, uh, collapse regarded as a dynamical process when I measure on one side of a system seems to do something instantaneous on the other side of the system. And of course, in relativistic physics, there's no invariant notion of simultaneity. So you're led to ask, OK, how could collapse be formulated in a theory of that kind? And I'm not saying that collapse would be unsatisfactory in a relativistic theory. Of course it would. Everyone in philosophy of quantum mechanics knows that. I'm saying that if you look in textbooks in relativistic quantum mechanics, you don't find even a really unsatisfactory statement of a collapse rule. You don't find a collapse rule which is philosophically or conceptually unreasonable in any number of ways. You simply don't find a collapse rule at all. And yet, relativistic quantum mechanics doesn't seem to have a great deal of trouble in providing empirical predictions which we then check against what experimentalists tell us. In other words, the absence of collapse in relativistic quantum mechanics doesn't seem to be getting in the way of the use of relativistic quantum mechanics. So we can at least tentatively conclude that Collapse is not needed in relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay, second observation. Theoretical physicists in 
string theory, quantum cosmology, quantum gravity, have been worried sick for 40 years about the so-called quantum information loss paradox in the decay of black holes. And the form of that paradox doesn't really matter for this talk, but what it boils down to is that it seems that in enormously exotic situations, the complete evaporation of black holes by Hawking radiation, the process of that, um, uh, that evaporation can't be described by unitary dynamics. In other words, there's a violation of unitarity in these extremely exotic physical situations. And theoretical physicists have torn their hair out at this. It's been a massive issue that's attracted a huge amount of attention, uh, in, attracted an enormous amount of work to try to come to terms with this or to try to work out how the arguments that seem to violate unitarity can be modified so as to restore unitarity. There's now a fairly widespread, though not universal, consensus, at least in string theory, that we do get unitarity back. And this tells us something deep and profound about the way in which black holes decay. And I want to sort of humbly suggest that if the, physics, if the theoretical physics community has regarded it as completely unacceptable that we can have a dynamical process that's non-unitary in these incredibly exotic astrophysical positions, then it's somewhat implausible to see them as committed to non-unitary dynamics happening all over the place in the most mundane cases of experiment in any lab in any, in any physics department in the world. Third example. Any advanced textbook quantum mechanics, and certainly any textbook in quantum field theory, fairly quickly introduces its reader to the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics as a sort of alternative way to formulate quantum mechanics from the Hilbert space states observables way of formulating it I sketched at the beginning of the lecture. On the path integral approach, or the sum over histories approach, the central objects are trajectories in the configuration space of the system. Each is assigned an amplitude. By summing the amplitudes over all of the trajectories between initial and final state, we're supposed to work out the transition amplitude from one to the other. And this formulation is generally said to be equivalent to standard um, Hilbert space quantum mechanics. For various technical reasons that don't matter here, it's often substantially more convenient as a way of doing quantum field theory, particularly in situations where various um, relativistic or gauge symmetries are present. It's a, it's a workhorse of quantum field theory. I have never seen the collapse postulate formulated in the path integral version of quantum mechanics. That's not to say it could not be formulated. I can kind of guess what it might look like. It's saying it is not, in fact, formulated. And so again, we see that the application of physics just doesn't seem to be needing the Klatz postulate in one of its central um, theoretical uses. And finally, and this is scarcely more than indicative, but if you do uh, a search of the archives of physical review for terms like projection, postulate, collapse of the wave function, and natural synonyms, you find in total maybe a few hundred references. Uh, nearly all of them are to explicitly foundational discussions or to proposed alternatives to quantum mechanics or dynamical collapse theories. You find, by comparison, you know, several tens of thousands of references to something like decoherence. So I think there's fairly good indirect grounds to think that CLAPS cannot be playing a significant role in physics, quantum physics as it is practiced. Let me start making a bit more of a direct case that CLAPS shouldn't be regarded as part of the orthodoxy. Let's consider the case of repeated measurements. So I measure some observable, and then shortly afterwards, I measure it again. And the case of repeated measurements is actually a standard illustration in many introductory textbooks and in Dirac's original work on quantum mechanics of why we need a collapse rule in the first place. The need for repeated measurements to give the same result is a standard argument that gets used as to why we have to have a collapse rule. And here's how that goes. Suppose I have some system that is a superposition, let's use spin measurements, I have a quantum state alpha spin up plus beta spin down with respect to some spin axis. And I measure it. Um, and let's say, for the sake of argument, I get results spin up. The probability of that is mod alpha squared by the Born rule. If the quantum state doesn't collapse, if it remains alpha spin up plus beta spin down, then of course, on the second measurement, there's probability mod beta squared of getting down. And in general, there's, prob there's, there's probability 2 mod alpha squared mod beta squared of getting a different result 
on the two measurements. If I apply claps, on the other hand, then whatever result I get, the system is now in that eigenstate. So if I get spin up as the result, the quantum state is now, out, is now up. And if I get spin down, the quantum state is now down. And either way, I'm guaranteed to get the res same result when the two measurements are repeated. So it looks like we need claps to make sure that repeated measurements reliably give the same results. The only problem is repeated measurements don't reliably give the same results. So for instance, in the, in, in the spin case I'm describing there, um, the standard way you might make that measurement is something like the stern gerlach process, where I take my, uh, my beam of spinning particles and I separate them by submagnetic fields so that, the, uh, so, so that a, a spin-up particle would go this way and a spin-up down particle would go this way. And then I slam the particles really hard into some kind of screen. And the process of being slammed really hard into some kind of screen is not a very reliable way to ensure that the particle's spin is preserved for subsequent measurements. You can give more dramatic examples of that. So if you consider doing these experiments with, say, photon polarization rather than electron spin, the standard measurement of the state of a photon annihilates the photon. A photon, a photon detector typically absorbs the photon so that there is no photon left. The result of a repeat of a, a repeat of a photon measurement in most um, quantum photonics is that the second result of the measurement will just say there isn't a photon at all. Sorry. And just more generally, the strategy of hitting something really, really hard into something else and then looking at the rubble that, that results is more or less a sort of go-to workhorse of experimental physics. There are measurements that give the same results. They get called non-disturbing measurements. They are really quite delicate and difficult to set up. They can be done, but it requires significant experimental care to do them right. So we're left with a slightly awkward idea that we're supposed to introduce claps to make sure that me repeated measurements give the same results. We should only do that for that subset of measurements that, in fact, on repeating, give the same results. This is beginning to sound a little bit circular. But physics actually has a perfectly straightforward process um, in practice for working out whether a repeated measurement gives the same results. And you'll see it in any theoretical analysis of repeated measurements in the literature on non-disturbing measurements. And the way we do it is we model the whole measurement process physically. We expand the Hilbert space to include the degrees of freedom of the measurement device, at least schematically. And we evolve the whole thing unilaterally and don't clap, sorry, unitarily and don't collapse anything. So for instance, in the case of spin, the, um, the sort of canonical form of a spin measurement would be something like my measurement device has a state that you might call ready. And if I start the particle in spin up and the measurement device in ready, then it'll evolve into some state where the particle is in some state or other, who knows what, and the measurement device is now in some state you might label up. So schematically labeling the pointer being on this side of the apparatus or something like that. And similarly, if the system is in the, um, the down state, then here's what happens. So now if you consider running the measurement process twice using two copies of the measurement device and the same interaction, what happens on the second run is going to depend on what the state of the spin particle is after the first run. So in one extreme, let's suppose that the state of the spin particle after the measurement is the same as before on this evolution. So phi up equals up, phi down equals down. Well, in that case, what I'll find is if I start with something like alpha up plus beta down, ready, ready, It'll evolve into something like alpha up, 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 plus beta spin down, down, down. And now if I apply the Born rule, I find that with, 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 with no, no clats going on here, just the unit dynamic plus the Born rule, if I apply the Born rule, I find that with probability mod alpha squared, both of the results are up. 
with probability mod beta squared, both of the results are down. And with probability zero, I get the different results on the two measurements. At the other extreme, if you suppose that the measurement process reliably leaves the spin of the particle in the spin up state, so that um, phi up is up, but phi down is also up, then what I get in the repeated process, this is called this the non-disturbing case, called this the max disturbing case, you'd find the whole thing will evolve to, uh, after the first measurement process, then the, me the measuring device will be in a superposition of getting up and getting down, and the particle itself will reliably be in the up state. So after the second process, I'll end up with alpha up, 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 plus beta up, down, up. So with probability 1, the second measurement will give spin up. And so with probability mod alpha squared, I'll get the same result on the two measurements. And probability mod beta squared, I'll get different results on the two measurements. So the, the unitary description of the process using the, the, dynamic, the Schrodinger dynamics and the Born rule gives us a perfectly clear understanding of what's going on in repeated measurements. The collapse rule isn't needed here. And if we'd tried using the collapse rule, we'd have got the answer wrong. We have erroneously concluded that the repeated measurement would give the same result when, in fact, the physics of the process says exactly that it will not. OK, here's a second example. Consider, instead of repeated measurements, think about continuous measurements. So when you read popular science accounts of Schrodinger's cat, you find that invariably the way the experiment is described is that, well, invariably is too strong. The way the experiment was originally described by Schrodinger, and frequently the way it is described in popular science, is that we take a radioisotope source and a Geiger counter and we arrange things so that if the Geiger counter clicks, something unspeakable happens to the poor cat. And we wait for a length of time such that there is a 50% probability of a decay having occurred in that time. And then we come back and we have a look. It's a continuous process. In foundational discussions that get quantitative, one almost never sees it that way. What one sees is a sharp, discrete process where Let's say, for instance, we couple the poor cat to some measurement device that makes a spin measurement on a superposition of spin up and spin down. We do a one-off process, and then we kill the cat. And I think that's not entirely a coincidence, because that continuous observation process is quite difficult to treat in the wave function collapse uh, you know, uh, measurement changes the dynamics approach to doing quantum mechanics. It's not at all difficult to treat just in the sense of getting out the prediction for radioactive decay or any continuous process using the Born rule. But here's a schematic way of doing it. Basically, if I had the, 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 the schematic form of radioactive decay looks something like this. I've got, here's the quantum, it's probably the point, doesn't it? Here's the quantum state at time t, and it's a superposition of two terms. This term uh, is the state of the system undecayed with an amplitude that's decaying exponentially. Here I have an integral of a whole bunch of different states the system could have been in if decayed. So by decay product semicolon some time, I mean schematically the state of the system that length of time after the decay has happened. And this is derivable under some, some, some approximations, specifically that the decay products get out of the way much faster than the time scale here for the decay process to happen. And the quantum mechanics of this is fine. I mean, Doing the concrete calculations for something like radioactive decay is beyond the calculational state of the art, except numerically. But the general phenomenological schematic form is not problematic. But now try plugging that into wave function collapse of measurement. The Geiger counter is continually observing the system. There's, no, there's nothing discrete about the process here. There's nothing discrete about the decay framework here. How do we represent that continuous process with, um, with some kind of notion of measurement which says that measurement corresponds to an instantaneous discrete collapse? Well, one thing you might naturally try is say, OK, what about if I say I'll make a discrete number of measurements and then I'll allow the time interval between the measurements to go to zero? So continuous observation is just to be understood as the continuum limit of discrete observation. So I could just read to myself. 
If we try that, something funny happens. Um, as Mr. Sudarshan showed pretty much 40 years ago, what happens if you take that limiting process is not a smooth, well-defined notion of continual observation. It's the complete freezing of the dynamics of the system. So the quantum Zeno effect tells us that as you allow the frequency of sharp von Neumann collapse type measurements to go to infinity, um, then the system is just frozen into its initial state. The, the prediction you get if you applied that rule to the radioactive decay is that the system will be undecayed with certainty. And Misra and Sudarshan in their 1970s paper, at least for the purpose of the paper, did genuinely regard this as a paradox because they were taking the collapse rule as part of quantum mechanics. And they, they pointed out that we do just seem to observe things continuously all the time. I'm continuously observing the people in this room. And yet, you seem to be moving. And they wanted to claim that the, the very fact that we have um, continu um, dynamical evolution happening against the backdrop of continuous observation was some sort of foundational paradox in quantum mechanics. But as a historical point, I don't know to what extent they were running that as a sort of modest proposal to point out a confusion and to what extent they genuinely thought this was a deep paradox. But at least, if one takes collapses at face value, it does seem to be a deep paradox. We have to handle continuous observation. The only natural way to handle it seems to be in conflict with observation. But it's totally unproblematic how to handle <coughs> um, continuous observation if we apply the same framework I was describing for repeated measurement. In other words, if we simply incorporate the measurement device into the closed system Hilbert space dynamics, we do all of our evolution unitarily, we don't apply any claps, and we just use the Born rule to read off the probability of the detector having clicked at a given time. And what we find uh, is that what, what replaces the frequency of measurement for sharp discrete measurements is the response time of the measurement device. So if, as is realistically the case for real Geiger counters, for instance, the response time it takes for the measurement to be registered is long compared to the time scale of which the decay products get out of the way, if that's the case, then what the unitary quantum mechanics tells you is that the radioactive decay proceeds totally unproblematically and is entangled with the state of the measurement device so that uh, the measurement device itself is also tracking an exponentially increasing probability of a decay having happened. And the, the, the entanglement will tell you that the probability of the measurement of the, of the detector having clicked conditional on the particle having decayed is close to 1. If, on the other hand, and you can't do this in nuclear physics, but you can do it in atomic physics, and it's been empirically tested, if, on the other hand, your measurement device has a response time that is fast compared to the actual decay transition time scales, it's genuinely the case that putting the measurement device in dynamical contact with the system um, freezes or at least strongly inhibits its dynamics. The Zeno effect is lovely physics. It can be handled perfectly straightforwardly in quantum mechanics. But it can be handled perfectly straightforwardly in the quantum mechanics we get if we just use the Schrodinger equation of the Born rule and if we put claps out of the way. OK, so much for claps. I want to claim that the inapplicability of the claps rule in a whole bunch of perfectly straightforward mainstream applications of, of um, quantum physics demonstrates that it, it shouldn't be thought of as part of what we're doing in orthodoxy. Let me make the analogous case for the eigenvector eigenvalue link. So let me just start quickly on the indirect evidence here. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the eigenvector eigenvalue link seems mostly to be an invention of philosophers anyway. If you do that analogous physical review search for um, the eigenvector eigenvalue link and, and natural synonyms, I think you get something like eight, re eight responses in physical review. <coughs> but let's talk about the the more direct, direct reasons why, again, think of the eigenvector eigenvalue link as part of orthodox quantum mechanics is going to get us into trouble. So let's do a warm-up case. Let's think about the case of position. I, I rather sloppily talked earlier about my lectern being in an eigenstate of center of mass position here. As anyone who knows about the quantum mechanics of position knows, things aren't that simple. So the position observable is, in Dirac's style of writing, has this decomposition its eigenstates are improper, which is to say they're not actually vectors in the Hilbert space. They're not actually legal quantum states for a system to be in. There are ways you can, 
finesse and generalize that. But in the standard way of doing quantum mechanics in Hilbert space, these vectors are not legal states. We can talk about superpositions of them in a slightly indirect state via distribution theory. They're very useful mathematical tools, but they have to be thought as sort of scaffolding from which one, from which one builds legal quantum states rather than as legal quantum states in themselves. All right, so, so a quick glib objection to the eigenvector eigenvalue link would be to say, well, no system can have a definite position. But that's actually not a good objection. Um, that would be a, a cheap response. We know perfectly well, von Neumann pointed this out, that I can always take some region sigma. I can integrate the projectors over onto these improper eigenstates over that region sigma. And the result is I get out a perfectly well-defined quantum mechanical projector onto states um, whose wave function is localized in that region. And so by the eigenvector eigenvalue link, I can say that this projector corresponds to the property of being in region sigma. So a particle is definitely in region sigma if it's an eigenstate with eigenvalue 1, i.e. if it's got a support in sigma. It's definitely not in sigma if it vanishes within sigma. So just to illustrate. In one dimension, if is the wave function, is the spatial coordinate, here's sigma. So the states that would count as having definite position within sigma would be things like oh, that. This. So notwithstanding my inability to draw straight, this function exactly vanishes outside sigma, appears as a sort of hump within sigma, and then exactly vanishes on the other side. Okay. So according to the eigenvector eigenvalue link, that's how we ought to think about definite position particles. Okay, 